we have a natural response when we are exposed to death in an abstract way. You're just watching the news and you are looking at peril and terror. And when that happens, there's a natural reaction that we want to double down on whatever worldview we have. Uh, This is not conscious. It's all subconscious. It's fascinating. I know I may not endure forever, but at least my belief in the Chicago Bears will continue on because that team will continue on. The abstract death stuff we're receiving, it doesn't do us favors. Welcome to the show, Jody. Great to have you. Oh, I am so excited to be here to remind you all that you're totally going to die. Yay. Well, the title of your book sounds like the latest James Bond movie. What <laughs> drew you to the study of positive psychology and regret? Well, I've been involved in, like, let's say the traditional helping professions, you know, like you guys, right? So I was coaching for 10 years after leadership and working in development and about 198 years ago, I started my career as a personal trainer, but those those days have long since passed, let me tell you. Um, but I'm always interested in like, how do we live life a little bit better? You know, how do we make the most of it? And so positive psychology was just a natural extension of that, right? It's like, well, how could I just, you know, learn more about the study of well-being and what makes us thrive? So that part wasn't obvious, but the little like the morbid twist, you know, this whole topic about mortality as a motivator. That was uh, that does not usually sit firmly in positive psychology, but I just couldn't deny it that it was just a it was a, a fascinating topic for me that I couldn't stop thinking about and then therefore needed to, you know, focus on for the rest of my life. I think most of us try to avoid thinking about death. Was there something in particular that led to that thought process for you? Yeah, well first of all, yeah, you're totally not alone, right? Like it's one of the biggest taboos that we just don't want to talk about. And I get it. Like, I respect that not everybody is, is um, as scintillated by the idea as I am. But I think, you know, I've always found it fascinating that we, all, we are working hard to enjoy life. And then all of a sudden, it's just going to mysteriously end. That always did, um, that did intrigue me. And as, you know, I think, Michael, you know, you know, my mom died uh, early, like in her fifties, late fifties. And I became so exposed through that process of this concept of coulda, shoulda, what is like this idea that we have ideas for ourselves, you know, businesses we might want to start or plans or dreams, things we want to do. And that, you know, we actually have to take action on them because you might die and when you might die early and then live a life that, you know, if you were going to give yourself marks at the end, not that I believe we do that when we die, but that, man, like, did I squander my time? So that, like, that literally shook me to the core because my mom did die with a bunch of those coulda, shoulda, would it's at least as, you know, I perceive. And, and I know she admitted to it, too, as she got, you know, closer to the end. So, yeah, I just want us to live squander-free lives. Yeah, and you address this dilemma early on in your book where we as humans, just generally, we on one side, we take everything we have for granted forever. On the other side, uh, we put things off because tomorrow is another day. And then lastly, we want to live life to the fullest. And those three things, just they don't fit into the same drawer. Like that, that there's, there's quite a dilemma there. There is. And I'm always fascinated by this notion that, like, that, what was it, Nietzsche? Like, man is the only animal that needs to be encouraged to live. So, and we're so complicated, right? Like on one hand, we're like, yeah, I've got a bucket list. And it's like, eh, is it a bunch of bullshit though? Like, do we, are we really going to take action on it if what we're doing is just marking it down? And there's some research that I find fascinating that when we sometimes indulge for a quick second in a goal or a dream we have for ourselves, we get just satisfied enough to then do nothing about it. Like it feels like just enough of a feel good, you know, and then we're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then you go and you like answer emails. Versus being like, no, but really, like, if if I knew my time was limited, oh, like it is, or if I really did the math, because you guys know I like to count how many Mondays we have left, like, could that be the thing that actually makes me go, dude, like, you're going to need to take this seriously, because you might not even have that many Mondays if I'm just being like super morbid about it. I mean, obviously, we might get more. I should be optimistic, but. Not that we necessarily want more Mondays. (laughs) I think a lot of us dread Mondays in general. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's say Fridays. But that idea of calculating, why is that so powerful for us to actually start to quantify the value of time in our life? 
we all get that we have an end and we all typically think of it in terms of years, right? Like most of us would rather not make the math happen and realize how many years we have left, but we've kind of rationalized that. So I like to make it more granular and we need sometimes not only just to see it in a different number, but the science behind it is that, you know, this notion about um, how we look at time, temporal scarcity is what it's called. And it's this wake up of if I see that something is limited time only, it is going to make me appreciate it more. And we go about our days in ways that reflect that we are taking them for granted typically, right? We avoid the thought of death. I understand why. It's certainly not a party. But we're not using that sense of scarcity to our advantage that can be the motivator that makes us think, oh, whoa, whoa. Like if I only have... 1,830, which is like true for me today, this week, like, I don't want to delay the stuff that I keep thinking I'm going to get to do later. So it's meant to be an appropriate kick in the butt. Yeah. I certainly feel when you're on vacation or when you're engaging in something that's really meaningful, if you take a step back and think, well, how many more moments like this am I going to have in my life? And am I really relishing and savoring as much as I can? Or am I just going through it because I'm here. And for some reason, for me personally, that's come up on some recent vacations around, you know, starting a family and are we going to travel like this? Am I going to have this level of freedom to travel in this way? Uh, am I going to be able to step away from work in the future like this? Um, so it was very present for me on vacations. I know for some, when they become parents, it becomes very present as you watch your child grow up and you see they're no longer a toddler and now they're off to school and, oh, I'm not going to get those moments with them anymore. Totally. Yeah, we can get really ridiculous with the countdowns, right? So I actually have a section in my book where I talk about if it is for people with kids, like, okay, how many more summers do we have, you know, realistically before they like never want to even spend time with you? Or, you know, how many more big vacations do you have? I, I know a lot of people that really just take one big trip, you know, every few years, like something that feels epic to them. Maybe it's because of finances or time or whatever. And it's like, oh, okay. I, how many of those then will realistically you be able to fit in? And I mean, it does seem like a bit of a downer, but for many of us, you know, when we're younger, we have this notion that the world's our oyster, we're going to get to do everything. And I still fundamentally believe like we, like we really do get to do whatever we want, but at some point, like I'm past the halfway mark, like there's not going to be enough time to do all the things. And so now we just need to be more judicious with our time. And I think, again, that's what the value of a countdown is, is like, okay, if I realistically have this many more really cool vacations overseas, for example, just to use the vacation example, it's like, well, maybe I'm going to need to prioritize. Like maybe I'm going to need to say these ones are the musts and these ones would be the nice to goes. Uh, and, and that again is all about using this to really get pointed about how we do spend our time. Because right now, yeah, we just, we take it for granted. I mean, do you guys take it? Do you agree? Do you feel like you take it for granted or that it, you just, end up in a like a autopilot existence for me getting more granular with the countdowns not just my 1660 mondays slash fridays that i still have but after reading the book i got granular about certain friends that i don't see very often family members that i see three times a year i right? do the do the do the countdown of and let's be optimistic and say okay they're going to live to their hundreds but we're still looking at a two-digit number of times that I'll still see them. And, and the precious thing about me in that regard is the presence that it brings to the, to the meeting. Like, I'm not going to check my phone. I'm not going to be late. I'm not going to be unprepared or without a cake or without anything. It's like, no, there's, let's say, 19 more times I'm seeing this person. Let, let me make this afternoon fully count and not get distracted. I love that. And did I hear that then you're going to bring a cake 19 times? Depends. I mean, if you if you knew my cakes, they would probably like lower the number that I see that person more than like raise it. Um, but cake might be in the offering. What I think is an interesting point that Michael brings up, and I, I know for myself, when thinking about family members and their mortality, it's easier for me to quantify. Thinking about grandparents and time spent with them, parents and time spent with them. Um, but for some reason, it's it's still more challenging for me to want to do the math on myself you know, and really think about, okay, like the average age is let's say 80 and okay, now I got to do the math backwards. 
But it's very easy for me to go, oh, well, you know, grandma is getting up there. So it probably is only a couple more summers together. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're hitting on something key. And that might be like, this is your portal in, you know, to talking about memento mori. And I think that that is one heck of a better way to do it than to not do it at all. And then I would have to be the voice that's standing up for you in all this and saying, okay, if you're only hinging it off of other people's timelines, because they're all destined to perish too, unfortunately, then what about your life? Like, what about the dreams and hopes you have for yourself? Anything that might be on your proverbial bucket list? Like, if it's not connected to someone else, you know, then, yeah. how, then how is it that you are using that sort of sense of, I had better get on with it, you know? And so that's, that's maybe where the opportunity is for you. Yeah, I certainly recognize that in in reading the book and thinking about the life calculator that it's just been far easier for me to look around and see it in other people than it is for me to to think about it for myself. And I don't think me personally when I think of death, I tie it to the grief of loss in my family and the difficult emotions that go along with it, but linking it to happiness and then trying to move into a place of how do I find and create more happiness in my life based around this impending death. It's counterintuitive. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, and that's how interesting with motivation science, it's like we often need the nudge about like avoiding pain or problem, right? More so than we feel inclined to just pursue what's awesome. And I always hate that, you know, as a positive psychology practitioner, like why are we better than that? You know, why aren't we wired? And, and I'm speaking to, to people here who are very pro like self-development. And so we're, you're more inclined than the average Joe to want to go for the gusto. But let's be honest, even like we're mere mortals, you know, and we're, we're still going about the going through the motion sometimes. I do think that it is that, uh, that it's that difficulty. It is the discomfort that can be the thing. If you indulge it for just, for just a little bit. And what that might look like if you need to like piggyback off of other people's mortality. I've seen it work where you might look at a, a friend that passed away early. And yes, we've got complicated emotions around grief for sure. And they, we can, you know, experience that emotion in addition to another emotion at the same time, which might be, God, that's horrible and terrible. And I miss them and I'm sad. And holy crap, is that a wake up call from me that I could go within like a 10 year gap and like that would not be cool for all the things that I was kind of hoping and banking on getting to do. And so if my timeline's actually shorter than I wanted, fine, I will not do the math, fine. Um, but then what, okay, well, what do I want to fit in? It's just this constant act of reprioritizing. And I think since we're talking about goals here as well, you make a very important distinction between seeing death everywhere in the news and the wherever you know there there are wars disasters happening and people die and we're exposed to that whenever we turn on the news which would be um, i think terror management th theory compared which which leads us to set the wrong goals and the wrong ambitions compared to uh, death meditation where we look at our own death could you talk about the the problems with uh, terror management theory and what it that leads us to uh, pursue? Yeah, yeah. Happy to. So terror management theory, in addition to just having a fascinating name, uh, is this study where it recognizes we have a natural response when we are exposed to death in an abstract way. Okay, so let's say it is that, yeah, you're, you're just watching the news and you are looking at peril and terror and war, etc. Or you're watching any movie and someone dies, you know, and you are not contemplating your own mortality thoroughly, but it's just, it's a matter of exposure. It's called mortality salience for the nerds of us in the room. And when that happens, there's a natural reaction that we want to double down on whatever worldview we have. And that could be something that feels like your political party or your religious belief system, your philosophical beliefs, um, any group that you are a part of that you feel like, it's funny, it triggers this thing called symbolic immortality where it's like, okay, fine, I know that I, uh, this is not conscious, it's all subconscious, it's fascinating. I know I may not endure forever, but at least my belief in the Chicago Bears will continue on because that team will continue on or this political party will endure or my country will remain a country, you know, the like sense of nationalism, right? So that in itself, you're like, well, what's wrong with that? Adhering to a worldview, it's that we sometimes then get a little bit pissy when um, other people start to talk about their worldview that differs from yours. Because if you tell me that you believe something different politically, 
than I do. That's kind of now all of a sudden putting my footing on shaky ground that about this whole symbolic immortality thing. And we often make decisions that boost our self-esteem. And that's not always pro-social. It's usually a little bit like, how do I look good in the culture that I want to, again, be accepted in for the worldview? All this is to say, the abstract death stuff we're receiving, it doesn't do us favors. And it does make us do things, AJ, like you're thinking, like, yeah, I don't really think I want to talk. I don't think I really want to do the math. It's kind of doesn't make me feel good. I totally get it. The encouragement, if I could be so bold, is to do it in the way that research says actually is super effective. It's to really get like contemplating. It's to take it seriously and say, whoa, okay, what if I did sit back and really reflect on my time left and how I feel about it? And what could that do for me? And now when I do compare that to the things that I yearn to do, that I might be prolonging just because I have a natural notion that I'll get to do it later, do I really feel that this is the right way I am managing my precious time? So that tends to bring out more of an action orientation rather than a uh, the other crappy stuff from terror management theory. That was a mouthful of a lesson, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but a good one. So... While this is like we've been talking about death and kind of like dark and morbid terms, so in 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 your book you follow a couple of steps. Where first uh, we do a pre mortem and we look at the dead zones in our lives, which I'd love you, for you to expand on a little bit because I think it applies to a lot of um, us, <laughs> us here in the room. I don't know. I'm speaking for myself and, and those and those listening. Just identifying those freaking dead zones that we have in our life, and and then. Uh, dear listener, we'll we'll jump to the good stuff and talk about how do we actually bring life in, meaning and vitality. Um, but let's shine the spotlight on on those darn dead zones, maybe first. Exactly, yeah. And we won't, yeah, we won't linger here. But I do think we need to recognize that by diagnosing what those dead zones are, and they could be in any domain of your life, right? Because we know we got so many pockets and parts of our lives. Like you could be thriving at work but your social life is just just absolutely flatlined or maybe you're feeling like your health is lacking or maybe you're feeling a little bit like your friendships you've let languish or your recreation like anything you might do for fun my research actually does show that most people are feeling like they're lacking on the vitality scale of needing a little more of that um, zest in life like participating doing cool things going to the concert having th having that kind of fun so it's diagnosing because sometimes you know, we just go through our lives sometimes in, in, in like a, a sort of subtle form of existence where we're not, we're not always doing the true self-reflection. And obviously, if you've got like great coaches and people helping you, like you guys help your clients, you can have that closer inward look. But sometimes we do have to stop and go, wait a sec. If I was to like literally take the pulse in these different areas of my life, are there any that are making me feel dead inside? Or at least, and sometimes... They're dead inside and you're like, yeah, uh, maybe you have a new family and you're like, yeah, I'm going to be letting my social life go for like the next three years. And that's like a conscious choice. Fine. But other times there's that, like, there's like it's squishy inside, you know, like it's like, it's telling you something where it's like, oh, when I look at that area and I talk and I think a little bit about my social life, I feel a little bit awkward. Like, I know I want to pick it back up again. You know, I want to reconnect to those friends that I've just always said, oh, we'll catch up one day when... We don't. So I think it's, it's it's getting honest with yourself and diagnosing where you might feel like you want to add more life into your life. And that is just an awareness that I think we sometimes don't pause enough to do. And that's in the pre-mortem. That is absolutely looking at how's the life going that you're living right now? Yeah, I think for a lot of our clients, they have a life event that forces that pre-mortem on them. Maybe it's passed over for a promotion. Maybe it's a breakup. It's a loss of a friendship. It's moving to a new area and recognizing, okay, I need to prioritize my social life. And those are really like shaky wake-up calls. But for those in the audience who are living life on autopilot, how can we actually evoke that same wake-up call right now? Yeah, this is exactly the thing I talk about by beginning with the mortality math. You know, for, so for many of us, it is awkward, but it is, let's look at how much time's left. And then another uh, technique around it is to do the good old fashioned tried and true deathbed regrets exercise, right? So imagining like tonight's the night and you are kicking back and you're like, all right, here's my life review. If my life was to flash before my eyes, yay, good for me. I had lots of fun over here, did cool things. 
And what would be the things that would make you feel those pangs of regret? And it's an exercise where you like literally jot down, there's no thing too small. There's no thing too big. It's just all the regrets. And to be clear, focusing on the regrets about the paths you didn't take. So the things you wished you had done, but hadn't, we're less interested in the regrets of the mistakes you made because whatever, it's water under the bridge. So by going through that exercise, that can act as a wake up call as well for, wait a minute, <laughs> like last I checked, I wasn't dying tonight. And so if I said I was going to really feel angry with myself that I didn't learn how to speak Italian, or I didn't visit the Croatian coast, or I didn't make up with my brother or I didn't take that cool online course, or I didn't start the business, you know, the list goes on. Well, holy crap, like now's your chance. Like these are pregrets, the regrets in the making. Like you can still make a choice today to take action on one of those things. And that's in service then of living a life that is worth living, that you'd feel proud of maybe when you got to the end, rather than that feeling of like, you know, I think when my mom died, the coulda, shoulda, wouldas. Yeah, it's that moment to take agency, to snap out of the autopilot, that we all tend to fall on as we graduate and get a job and start checking off other people's boxes of what success should be in our lives. Well, back to the autopilot specifically, usually it's an indication that we have gotten ourselves into one heck of a habit and a routine. And I'm like super suspicious of habits. And I think, um, you know, they're good for us if we, you know, allows us to bathe every day, for example, like I will not argue with the good hygiene habits. But I would say that for other, for the rest of the things, like we go through the motions and I think we have to interrogate our reality in a way like I often imagine, imagine if you had, you know, when they have those um, cameras when they're watching like a concert get set up and they show it in fast motion where it's like they set up a stage and then they set up all the things and the lights and whatever. And you're like, wow, that's pretty incredible. Imagine if you had a camera on you and you're weak and it went through fast motion would you be kind of like, yeah, we know what's happening. Like, is it the same thing every morning? Is it the same routine? Is it the same tech, like what you do for your, you know, are you rotating the same six dinners? Like I fall prey to that one. Are you doing the same thing on Saturday morning? Are we falling into routines that initially comfort us? Because it's like, yay, I know how, I know what I'm doing. I get, you know, it helps manage chaos. But that's our opportunity is to shake it up a little bit. And so that is one of the best ways is to stop and say, where do I, where can I add more novelty to my life? Like, is there something I'm doing? Do I need to like, even if something as basic as like, look in your freaking spice drawer and like, when was the last time you cooked with one of those spices? Or when was the last time you tried a totally different cuisine? Or when was the last time you went out and like read a different kind of book than you would normally read? Like shaking things up in your life just enough so that it snaps us out of that kind of highly functioning zombie routine that we tend to get stuck in. Yeah, I'm just picturing some of my fast forwarding uh, highlight being staring at my phone <laughs> and being frustrated with myself and, and scrolling. Well, you know, you're not alone, right? Oh, man, that's the magnet these days. Yeah, I know we, we rail against it quite a bit, but it is that one device that gives us that instant comfort in some of the chaos that we discussed, right? And managing that. And I think what I felt coming out of the pandemic was an urgency to get back to novelty, to get back to travel, to get back to those things that I felt that I lost. And we had this global event where everyone was faced with their mortality. We were all touched by it, knowing people who were passing, whose lives were disrupted, unable to do really important things, unable to, to get married, unable to bury family members, unable to travel and, and do the work that we want to do in our lives. So I feel like there was this like global wake-up call. Have you found research around what that has done for our, our view of mortality? I love that you brought this up because it was a fantastic example of how, wow, when we lose the ability to do something, we realize what we had. Oh, wow. I didn't even know I needed to be grateful that I could go out and go, go out to that cocktail bar or whatever it is. So it was temporal scarcity, but it wasn't temporal. It was just like, now I don't have it. And I think a lot of us have these then pent up dreams to do things but interestingly, so here's where, of course, there are stories about like revenge travel and spending and people trying to la or like make up for lost time. Some of that exists, but that's just the stuff that's like more obvious, flashier and noisier. We see it on social media. What is actually happening for many of us, and I let myself into this, is 
oh, how fast we come up with our new ways of living. So we adapt super fast, which is part of the problem. Like it's a good thing so that we can manage some of our anxiety, but usually it's sometimes it's like, but then we bore ourselves to death. Many of us have not actually come out of our COVID slumber. And that is true back to some of the research I do around people diagnosing themselves um, loosely, you know, but as meaningfully bored where, yeah, like my job, like I do good things for, you know, whoever my client is or my audience or whatever, or I help, you know, people in the hospital I work in, whatever. But we haven't created a new rhythm yet about getting up and out. And I don't know if you guys feel that way. I mean, maybe you're just like, no, the minute I could get back out there, I was there and I was like raring to go. But back to the idea about routines, we got used to a narrower way of living. We didn't love it, but then we just kind of kept living it. And then it just became like harder and harder, even when we could to like get up and out. Cause you're like, yeah, but I kind of got used to being on the couch. Like New York was famous for late dinners. And I don't know if you guys ever, you know, if you caught this stuff, like now it's like the early bird dinner. If people are going out at all, it's not so much the late night. It's like, if it was like, no, but I learned to love my couch. You know, I don't know if you guys felt that way post coming out of pandemic or what your lives are like now. Well, we had discussed yesterday that there was no great recovery, right? Like the, our institutions failed at every level of COVID, including uh, getting out of it. And so we still have people wearing masks. We still have people who are in fear of their lives for COVID. Um, and, and because there's, there hasn't been any full consensus of what was going on. So, of course, uh, we have people still asleep. We still have people who are living their lives uh, as if we were still in the deep of the throes of COVID. And to could we be completely honest with you, I, if you had, to, if you were to ask me where we're, we're at with that, I'd tell you I don't know because no one has said anything. Uh, the, the, make, the signals have been mixed from day one. The, all the messaging was absolutely confusing. And due to that, it has wrecked and impacted everyone's lives. It's such a good point you're making. And it is still in this weird sort of limbo of wait, what? And I think we're going to need to back to AJ, the word you used, like agency. You know, it's like all we can do is look at our own situations and go, okay, to what extent am I still living? Is it a conscious fear? Maybe. Or is it just to be super honest? Because I believe that this is the case for most of us is that we just created a new routine of not doing as much. You know, and so we're lacking in needing more vitality and or meaning because it could be both depending what, you know, floats your boat and what you need more of. So I think it's like, while we wait for history to tell us how it netted out, I think we can still be the ones to do exactly what we're talking about, which is like, okay, is if I do my pulse check and I realize that I've let my like uh, leisure life, like what's that? All I do is work now because I log in all day and I'm never logging off and like what a... Maybe that is, okay, you know what? Maybe I will go sign up for that photography class that I've been curious about. Like that's that's the initiative we can take is taking that like one step forward into something that actually you're kind of curious about. I feel like we owe ourselves that. Yeah, I think for many of us, we fell into survive. Yes. Obviously. And we've forgotten what it means to actually thrive and move beyond just survive. And for our clients in particular, that's really thrive socially. So we started to have distrust around strangers. Obviously, there's concern about catching something that could kill you. So naturally, we close off ourselves to outsiders and to strangers. We shrank our social circle if there was any socialization at all. And I don't think we've really broken through to the other side of like getting comfortable again with talking to strangers, interacting with new people, seeking new connections. And that's why a lot of clients approach us to do the work with us because they're recognizing some of these skills I had before have atrophied because I haven't been put in situations to use them. And I've been forced into this survival, fearful mode that I now recognize is not serving me and it's not allowing me to thrive and, and lead the fulfilling life that I want. Yeah. And back to like the last words, the fulfilling life I want. Again, that's like, do you even know what that looks like? Because I think, again, we can just go through our days without actually being clear. And I don't think it needs to be buttoned down. Like, let's leave room for spontaneity. Like, that's part of a great life, too, is like, I don't know where the wind might take me on my vacation. Like, let's let's leave it open to chance. And have we done a little bit of that, like, pre-mortem introspection to be like, what do I love to do? Like, what 
does bring me joy? What does make me feel like I'm in some way doing something that feels like purpose? And so those are those questions I think that are important too, um, to feel like we're defining and then being able to make choices to live a life that feels fulfilling for us, however we define it. And for our audience, do I have to do those things alone? Ooh. You know, that's really where I, I push back on a lot of our clients is, okay, maybe you found some things that bring you joy, but are you engaging them in isolation? Are you lone wolfing them? Are you choosing not to involve others who would find joy doing it with you? Yeah, you're reminding me, one of the founders of Positive Psychology, his name was Chris Peterson, may he rest in peace. When he was asked to distill positive psychology down to as few words as possible, um, he did a good job. He used three words. He said, other people matter. Um, and then he later elaborated by saying that um, there may be no happy hermits. <laughs> so the idea is like, where can we combine some of these things together? And I think you're onto it. It's like, okay, if you feel like, let's just say you do this diagnosis back, Michael, to what you were talking about, like finding your dead zones. And you're like, oh my God, my health has gone to shit. And my social life. It's like, well, what if you went and did that crazy aerial yoga thing with your friend that also was curious to try something new. So if you can combine things, I mean, oh, obviously that's like a time management win and a life win, you know? So with that, the flip side of the alive zone. So we recognize dead zones and obviously our listeners care about self-improvement and care about growing a fulfilling life. What do we do with our alive zones? Do we double down? Do we say, oh, that box is checked and I can move on? How do we view those areas of our life that are alive? <laughs> yeah, because of that whole hedonic treadmill thing that exists, you know, we adapt to every single great thing and crap thing in our lives. We definitely need to nurture it and pay more attention to it. And so most go-getters like y'all and your clients, uh, we're not satisfied to just be like in the astonishingly alive zone, which just by definition is like anywhere plus on vitality and anywhere plus on meaning. So when we're there, like, we're not just going to like sit back and light up a smoke necessarily. We're going to be like, you know what? I want more. Like, I would love to know what else it's going to take. Like, how do I get to the next level in this class? Like, how do I, how do I max it out? And it's just kind of like inching over and up on this spectrum, which happens to be in like the top right corner of this spectrum, of this quadrant. So the double down is, is actually the easiest, lowest hanging fruit in, you know, at least in the world of, you know, positive psychology or just like what you, you know, self-improvement, right? It's like, we think sometimes we have to reinvent the wheel. We've got to find this new thing. And if that is interesting to you, oh, great, keep finding new things if it really serves you. But most of us are missing the chance to go, okay, wait a sec. What is it right now? Like if this thing I do is bringing me such joy, like when I hang out with this friend, every time we go to lunch, he makes me laugh. We have a great time. I'm always like scintillated by learning new things. Like go out with him for lunch more. Like what are we doing? We have the answers to the freaking test of how we should live our lives. Like max out more of what's there. Like that's positive psychology. One on one is enhancing and maximizing your strengths and what's good. So we don't need to go and find a new friend to bring us to, I mean, do that too. But like, what about that? What about every time I am in a, I'm just thinking of a client, she's like, oh, in a bubble bath. Or I just finished a conversation with a friend who's like, she got into drumming and she's like, the drums, that was like the life I needed to live outside of my busy work life. And when she is doing the drums, she's like, she gets into flow, you know, that important psychological state. She's like, I am like, all of a sudden it's nine at night and I don't know what the hell happened. Like the, I was just in it and like, oh yeah, you know what? Could like, could you do that more? Like those are the easy things that I think we overlook. Do more of what's already serving us. And with the dead zones we've recognized, how do we start to move them to that astonishingly alive state? That's back to that pulse check of, okay, we got to, we already got a framework. We're living wider with vitality and deeper with meaning. That's what we want. For many of us, one of those is going to cause that little niggling and pay attention to that. So you got to start somewhere. And so, okay, which one gave you that uncomfortable feeling the most? Is it, yeah, is it vitality? I haven't really been getting, having as much fun lately. Or is it meaning like, yeah, no, I've been having fun. Fun's good. But I've been coming home feeling like an empty hollow shell. That's a shallow kind of guy or gal. Like that's a good, like know that. And then identify what is one thing on either one of those spectrums that can help to move the needle a little bit. And this is so not glamorous, but you guys know this, right? This is like so basic, but 
like this great life we long to live is not going to get handed to us. We have to actually fathom what, okay, what it might be. It's like, okay, yeah, you know what? I think I might want to do that mixed martial arts thing, which I would actually never answer, but let's just say for fun. And then, oh, I want to do MMA for sure. And then, okay, well, what would be like, where do like look it up and book a class? Like you actually have to put it in your calendar or else I think what we do is we do this thing and like, we all do this, right? I do all the time. I have a good intention. I have an idea. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm totally going to look into it. And like I said earlier, we feel just good enough to take zero action. Or we do that thing where like, yeah, I'm going to get to it at some point. Or like you say to friends, oh my gosh, we totally have to get together. I'll fly to Oregon. We'll get together one day soon. And then we break our integrity with ourselves in some little way where we're like, oh, I am a woman of all talk, no action. Or some talk, some action, and that's still just maybe not good enough for the life that I kind of want to live. I want to be like, I'm living, not to say large, like it's not for optics to be super clear. I don't like, I don't post my personal life too much on social media for people to see that I did or didn't see my friend in Oregon or that I did or didn't sign up for MMA, which you will never see. But like, you have to book it, you know? So I think that that's the key too is like identify is it vitality? Is it meaning? Pick one thing that might just in any way spark your interest and book a freaking class or just book the trip or like put it in your calendar or like plan the brunch with your friend. You get the idea? Well, an image that stuck out for me in the book is this idea of baking your own happiness pie. And you, Mm. you talk about some of us waiting for someone to hand us that delicious happiness pie, for someone to promote us, for someone to find us, for someone to date us, for someone to accept us and say, now you're happy. But in actuality, we have to look up the recipe of, is it an apple pie? Is it a key lime pie? And then we have to find the ingredients and bake our own happiness. And I think waiting is where we we feel the most just trudging along. Like what, what is holding me back from the happiness that I want versus taking the agency and, and getting the ingredients, assembling them, booking the class and baking the pie. The way you just described that, I think helped underscore Let's be honest, some of the reasons we don't take, woo, agency and initiative and motivation because we're going to die, like, it takes effort. Like, it actually takes effort to live a life you want to live. And I resent that fact, but it's true. And I talk a lot about how it's not just like you have to give a shit about your life, I say you have to give two shits. And like that means, like, being conscious and thinking about it and then planning it and making it happen. And we're not always going to nail it every month, you know, but like, it takes effort. And sometimes that's momentum that many of us who are on the couch and like, trust me, I I love the couch and like some quality Netflix time. It like a body on the couch watching Netflix remains a body on the couch watching Netflix. Like it takes effort to look up where you might want to take the drumming lessons or the tennis or whatever it is. Right. And then sometimes it takes money and time. And I recognize those are resources that aren't always ample. But we can also get creative, right? Um, So I think that um, we have to be prepared also for, I think it's like the dosing. I think it's that um, if we're already feeling like we might be in the dead zone or just not in that astonishing live zone and kind of like hoping for more, be like, okay, I can't overdo this because I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to discourage myself if I tried to take on too much too soon. What would be, again, one thing I could do today that just shows myself that I give two shits and, and getting the thing booked. So I think it's like pacing ourselves in our desire to just like live large. I call it a life worth fighting for. And for our clients, it's like, well, if you want it, are you willing to fight for it? Right. If, if that's the life that you find is amazing, right. Or the, the life that you want to be living. Okay. Well, if that's what you want, are you willing to fight for it? Because you're, you are you are going to have to get off the couch. You are going to have to put in effort. You are going to have to go out of your way to make these things happen. I've seen uh, many people talk about all of these things, but when I ask them, are you willing to fight for it? Well, then the, the conversation changes. So if that's what you want, uh, you better be willing to go after it. Johnny, I love your language around the fighting. It's like also giving our lives a fighting chance to be full of vitality and meaning. And that is back to this story of, uh, of identifying what, what, do you, what do you want to do and what would it take to book it today, to book it this week? I love that, though. You got to fight for it. Yeah, and that's why I enjoyed the 
baking a happiness pie analogy because so many of us would love to consume the delicious pie and that would be great. But in actuality, we have to take action in these areas once we recognize that this is a dead zone. This is meaningful. This is a pregret. This is something that I said I was going to do, bucket list, and you know, another year has gone by. A, a full pandemic has passed, and I haven't changed anything. Yeah, back to that pie. You know, I think a lot of people will think, well, you know, it's preordained. You know, the degree to which I'm going to be happy in life is something that you know, 50% of it roughly is your biology. Um, and some of it is definitely going to be circumstance. You, a lot of researchers will debate the percentages, whether it's 10 or 20, but it is not as much as we think. You know, it's a, the external things that are around us, oh, like a pandemic or, oh, like your sort of socioeconomic status you were born into or et cetera. There are things that will happen, you know, a car accident or so on. Um, but again, back to the idea that we do generally adapt to things that happen to us. And then the rest is intentional action, which is exactly what we're talking about. Um, living a life worth fighting for, living a life worth living. So what do you say to our listeners who are on the verge of an existential crisis thinking about death? I say, I'm right there with you. I get you. Like, I like the idea about like getting to the cusp of an existential crisis. Like I want like an existential, um, I don't know. Episode, like not crisis. Yeah, episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like let's, let's just like, if we can take the dose, but uh, it's an indication that that it, that um, I think that life matters, and it is an indication that there is fear, of course, and it is one of the greatest anxieties. And I think what we can do is um, I find solace in the research that shows that sometimes our fear of death is ameliorated by living life more fully now. So there is an indication for some people that their their correlation, like I'm more afraid of death if I feel like I haven't done this life justice, so that. I'm going to get to the end and feel that sense of my life was left unlived. And so, well, my obvious answer is just the, like, well, then golly, we have a good, good opportunity here. Um, so I think that um, recognizing that if an existential crisis type moment is often at a, at a big key life event, like you were saying, AJ and Johnny, like you have clients that come and like something's gone on. And those I actually are, I'm grateful for in life. Like if we, without a catharsis, like without some kind of an event that is going to incite us to take change, then that is when we often sometimes just like we languish in that slumbering existence again for year after year and sometimes decade after decade. So on one hand, I'm like, thank you for this event. Yes, I recognize I am, you know, shitting my pants at the idea that my time is going to be temporary. And is there an area where I might be able to make a decision to live more fully that might help to assuage that? And like getting more intimate with that idea. And again, back to what we said, not in a just a general way, but in a really deep, reflective way about what have I done so far in my life that I'm proud of? What do I want to be able to look back on and say I was proud of? Like literally the way that I lived. And um, this is not a judgment about what life should look like, because this is very I, this is not a prescription that your life needs to look or sound or feel a certain way, or, you know, you have to go to the following countries or concerts or events, right? It's like only you know what it helps, like when you feel like you've had, like this is my right dose of vitality and my right dose of meaning. And if we're being honest with ourselves, sometimes that's when we say, mm, you know, one, one area might, I mean, might need to turn the dial up. But I think it's that introspection that we have to do and like recognize that in the grand scheme of, okay, I don't feel so hot about this, but I've got 1,830 of these Mondays left. And now if I'm going to prioritize, here are the things that I would love to take action on before that time. So that last piece, there's a level of self-compassion and forgiveness too for the past that I think is important as we start to wrestle with these regrets and thoughts of Mondays that weren't so great. Thanks for noticing that. Yeah. If we could all just give ourselves a permission slip to just like let that stuff go, because it it doesn't typically matter. And I like the research that is um, exists in the regret science about how most of us find a way, whether it's through cognitive dissonance or any other way to just understand that, yeah, you know, I did that dumb thing, you know, like, yeah, I was a jackass or yeah, I had the affair or I did the bad thing and like, mm, wish I hadn't. But the haunting comes from the belief that, oh, you know, I always wanted to try that thing, to start that business, to start that podcast or whatever it is. And like, I didn't, because that's an indication sometimes, like that's fear running the, running the roost. And, and that is not, um, for most people, like that's the thing that will make us feel like, 
could there have been a better version of my life? And could that version have been one where, let's be honest, maybe it didn't work out, but most people are more proud of themselves for giving it a go and not having it work than not giving it a go at all. Yeah, that's such a salient point. I think for many of us who might be leading a life that's being run by regret right now around past mistakes or experiences or areas where we let ourselves down. Let's just, we are all officially forgiven. (laughs) We shall all say it in unison. So the book is full of great exercises and it's really active in the way it's written and the way that you can take lessons from it and apply it. I guess in conclusion, so now what? You know, you've, you've done the pre-mortem, you've looked at all these areas of your life, you may have recognized some things that need to change. What is the main thing you'd love our audience and your readers to take away from the book? I would be remiss if I didn't just come right back down to the theme, which is like befriend the Grim Reaper. Like the closer you can get to that guy, I mean, obviously with like, a, like enough of a healthy distance, because he will totally snuff your life out, but um, be not afraid. Like go near the thing that's scary because that can be that saving grace that we often need in order to see that perspective. So that is, of course, that's thematic as if it hasn't been made abundantly clear. But I would say from an action perspective, um, it is choosing the one thing because it would actually be really super sad and possibly ironic if we, you know, you get through nine chapters and you're all excited about, woo, I like, here are my dreams and here's, yes, I know where I am dead and I need the AED and I know what might make me feel alive inside and I'm going to push it off to retirement. Like, whoa, 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 that feels sadder than anything, right? So it's about picking the one thing. And then every time you do the thing, it builds a muscle. It builds a muscle of like aliveness inside of us that proves to ourselves like, yes, I am expanding my life, even whether it's post COVID or post depression or post fear or all the things that we post having a busy period of life or just, just, I lost the plot, you know, and I fell off the wagon of like living like I mean it. And so one little thing at a time with diligence. And if we can just do that and have something in our calendars to look forward to, as I always say, like every week and month and year in advance, like literally that's an assignment. Like, is there something in your calendar that you're looking forward to in those three timeframes? That is a good indication that we are like consistently making stuff happen for ourselves that makes us feel good. I love that. And I think it's a great place to wrap. Where can our audience find out more about the book and the work that you do, Jody? Well, I am over at 4000mondays.com. And if you don't feel like doing your own math on the resources page, there's a calculator that'll do your math for you. So there's that. Um, and the book is You Only Die Once, How to Make It to the End with No Regrets. And uh, ah, yeah, may we just do this life justice. No regrets. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, guys. Mm-hmm. 